Okay, I'm here as promised with Mr. Yeppe. Is it Yeppe? It's a, it's a soft G, yeah? That's right. It's Yeppe, Yeppe Kirk Bond. Mr. Yeppe Kirk Bond, how are you today? Very good, thank you. All right, so for all the people who um, maybe don't know anything about you, anything about your background, maybe brand new to eToro, uh, could you give a little rundown of who you are, how you started trading and what you're doing here? Yeah, so my background is in management consulting. So I used to work on, a, on strategy and transformation projects for large companies, including uh, technology companies, telecoms, and large financial institutions. And while I've been doing this, I've also been investing. So I started investing on eToro already back in 2013. Okay. And then um, now I work full-time only on investments. And since then, I've had an average return of 34% per year. So that's been, a, been, been very nice. And the style of investments that I do are based very much on fundamentals. So one of the products that we did when I was a management consultant, one of our top products was valuations. So we and especially to get sort of the foot in the door to talk with the CEOs of large companies, we'd uh, value what the company is worth. And that's basically what I invest on as well. So if I find that a company I think is really valuable, but the price doesn't fully reflect it, that's when I'll make an investment. Then I keep my sort of risk low by diversifying mainly. So I diversify across geographies, across different industries, across different stages of the value chain. I don't do too much hedging because it's expensive in terms of uh, insurance premiums. I try to focus on keeping my fees low. I currently have a little bit above two trades per week. I would like to have that even lower, but you know, if you sometimes need to change a lot in the portfolio, that'll cause you to pay those extra fees. I generally avoid shorting and using leverage, again, because of the fees for that. Yeah. So I, I try to sort of keep keep that in, in, in check. And um, yeah, and then, uh, of course, it changes year from year where I see the great opportunities. But it's also along these lines. These are sort of principles that stay in place. Okay, nice one. Um, so can you live off the money you make it, uh, trading on eToro? Apart from being like a PI, because that's sort of separate. Just your trading, could you actually live off it? So yes, yeah, so I, I have multiple streams of income, so I could live off of just my eToro trading. Okay. I could live off of just my uh, PI payments. I could live off just the rent I receive from renting out a flat I own, or I could, could work or do some contract and stuff like that. So I, I have multiple streams there, of course. If I do all of those things combined, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of money, but I, I, don't, uh, I, I, don't, I, I do mainly just then reinvest it. So it's, uh, and I don't think I'm going to suddenly take all my Toro money out and spend it on something, I think I'm just going to reinvest that and one day some kids going to inherit that. So that that's, uh, yeah. So also by spending wisely, you don't actually need, you know, uh, yeah, too much. That's, that's a lot of revenue streams. Good work. <laughs> wow, we, we all aspire to that at one point. Um, about the, the uh, I've got a lot of comments on the, uh, on the video where I said I was going to interview you. I got some comments from people under there. And I got some comments from the eToro investors community, this group on Facebook, which is really useful actually. And one of the, the main things they ask is about you know, what you see for the next kind of couple of years. Obviously everyone's been looking at 2018. It's been a tough year for a lot of people on eToro. It's caught a lot of people out. Um, what do you see is happening over the next couple of years in terms of mostly equities? You, know? you seem to yeah. be holding some of the, the FANG stocks, the big four. Uh, obviously they've become volatile this year. Where do you see that stuff going? And, and why didn't you close those positions in October? I saw you had sort of a lot of drawdown in October, mainly probably because of holding those ones. Why not close them? Why keep them open now? So I think for the next uh, years and even the next decade, if you look at how um, the prices of equities have been historically, they are about 25% higher now. So if you say that historically you've made an average return of 7% per year, and paying sort of 14, 15 times that for a stock, now you might be paying quite a bit more than that, maybe 20, 22 times that. So, so that's a bit bit more than the average. Now, does that tell you that the market should suddenly drop 20% to bring that back to average? No, that's not what it indicates. And more li the, the baseline that I sort of go for then is to say, instead of going maybe 7% per year for the average equity market, it might go at 5% per year yeah. as a baseline. <laughs> and then it'll sort of catch up. So if profits keep increasing by 7%, but the prices only increase by 5%, you sort of get back to that, uh, that uh, 
average historical level now. So then I look at the different asset classes for the next decade. Fine. So I might see equities go about 5%. But where do I see, for instance, bonds, corporate bonds, government bonds going? Well, they'll be slightly less than that as well. Where do I see something like commodities going? It could if suddenly there is a flight for safety it go quite higher. Now, obviously, when the oil price fires a lot, sometimes that's just because the dollar has gone up in value. But if you look at then having all your money just parked in a currency, for instance, where you see a lot of money are printed every year. So if you just, if the government were to just print enough money to, uh, if, if the economy grows by 3%, there are 3% more people, 3% more interactions, and 3% more money, inflation would be zero. So you kind of get if you have 2% inflation on top of that, you're sort of losing 5% of your money by having them in cash. So, so based on all those things, I said, okay, right, I'll rather have them in equity for the baseline of that. Now then, if you look at the US Central Bank Director, he made a very good speech, was it one or two weeks ago, where he sort of pointed out the same things that all other big banks are pointing out. Ooh, what about Brexit? Ooh, what about the China tariffs? Italy's economy is not looking that great. And if you go into like a tradingeconomics.com, you can always sort of see which countries seem to be in trouble. You know, they'll have a like a Argentina and Venezuela are certainly not looking very good in there. But I sort of find that these these are all risks that I'm okay with. They're within sort of manageable range. And I think the fact that the central bank director is giving a speech mentioning, ooh, we should be careful. I have concerns. These are the things we're looking at. Uh, you know, carefully towards that's m- that's much secure environment for me than like one from a uh, 2007 or 1928 where they're like, well, everything's going great. Why should we even regulate the financial sector? They seem to have everything under control. There are no worries whatsoever. Uh, so sort of, if everybody's cautious, that that that's sort of a, a good thing, I think. Now these risks are real, and these, um, I mean. You can sort of size them up. England might not take down the world, but anything that can sort of send a shock will always be dangerous because that that's in any sort of little issue can be nothing on its own but anything that can cause an industry a region a large country or something to not be able to roll over their short term debt yep. that's what can suddenly uh, you know make a trust amongst everybody evaporate and of course trust is a great generator of wealth in the world so yeah we need that yeah so uh, one of the questions was that actually are you going to um, are you anticipating holding more money in cash so having uh, less in in equities or are you uh, anticipating you said the flight to safety uh, so for people who don't understand I, I guess what you mean by that is people suddenly think one mu- section of the market is is tanking so they start quickly moving all of their money into another market do you sort of fear that there'll be a flight to safety into I don't know commodities or the classical gold or even cryptos now or is any of that stuff a concern to you or you just sort of priced it in and it's it's equities you're sticking with uh, I've priced it in any equities that I'm sticking to for now, but that would, whenever there is sort of an event, I'm, I try to size it up. Okay. Usually, if there's an event in the news and it's in, and you just, if you hear the word billions, you can sort of ignore it. If it's, if it's uh, got to be affecting the world economy, it's got to be in trillions. Okay. Um, but if I see something like that, then you have to compare the different asset classes because. I mean, if all asset classes move down or up, you know, no one's really better off or, or worse off. So it is sort of when uh, when suddenly large institutions are moving lots of money between asset classes. So they're saying we're going to hold a lot more currencies and a lot less corporate bonds. We're going to hold a lot more Asian equities and a lot less American equities. Okay. Then then um, yeah, then you you want to anticipate that and, and move over. And of course, at some point you might also diversify a bit more. And if interest rates uh, go high for, uh, for for instance, some corporate bonds, at some point you might also say, you know what, I prefer to make an, an average, um, now you should prefer to make a lot of that based on picking not just the right, uh, picking stocks, but picking the right stocks. But just for stocks in general, at some point you might say, I'd rather get a safe 5% than an unsafe 7%. Yeah. Um, but there's sort of a cutoff point, and then you might start saying, I have a little bit more, but not too much more. Okay, and uh, it, something you mentioned, obviously Brexit leads on to another big concern that's been in the comments. People are wondering um, how you are going to trade around Brexit, um, how much of an effect you think that's going to have. And obviously, because in your bio it says that you you worked with some of the big banks and sort of did uh, you know consultancy with them, they thought you might have sort of an inf- inside view, a bit of inside information about what's really happening from that point of view. I, I definitely have a, a good inside view, but it's from a completely different angle. Uh, my dad, he was a member of the European Parliament for 29 years. Okay. So I, he knows all the all the, the, the people in the European Union and, uh, and also some of the people here. So I often get some like a sort of insights from him, what are different people thinking, which avenues. And there's not agreement on it. Um, if you look down at like 
what the European Commission people think versus what they think in the council. Okay. There's definitely some different avenues. I've sort of sized them up and said, you know, hard Brexit, uh, are we going to end up with sort of 3% tariffs like the US? This yeah. Is going to be more like membership of the European economic area with 0%? Yeah. If, it, if, it, if it goes to, um, if it is voted down in all the parliaments now, you can kind of, um, in, in Denmark and Ireland, you know, we've had some votes on the EU in the past, and then we had a re-referendum. Okay. And then that's, I've been saying that basically since the beginning that I thought that was the most likely avenue. And that is, I still think, out of a lot of different scenarios, a quite likely avenue that you then could say something like um, we come up with some opt-outs. In Denmark, there are some opt-outs. So Denmark's not part of the defense policy, not part of the judicial policy. Okay. And also um, sometimes we break some of the rules a little bit. We'll get a citation. But yeah, yeah. Um, so that's definitely a likely avenue. And then in, so then how does that affect the markets? It's um, the markets definitely, if there's suddenly a, 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 a deal made or there is a, an outlook for a second referendum or something like that, that definitely have a, an initial positive reaction on the market. It might not do much to the overall economy, but it's definitely gonna gonna have an upside to the to the markets. And then um, it, it could also be that there's a reaction to the the price of the pound. So yeah. if there's a good news like that, maybe that'll make the pound stronger. It's not necessarily rational that it would do that, but that's just sort of a if everybody wants to believe that that should happen, then then, then that can can briefly happen. Do I invest much based on that? I mean, I have some of my UK stocks based on other things than that. And I accept if they are suddenly going to, you know, tank 12% from some bad Brexit news, or if I'm suddenly getting a windfall of 8% from that, that, that's sort of fine for me. I didn't pick those stocks just based on that. Could there be some other stocks though that could be, have some uh, great opportunities from this where you could say, well, what about... Um, could Ireland get like a, a better um, better position where they are sort of in between? Some companies would want to move to Ireland. It's pretty easy to move to Ireland. They speak English in Ireland. Could I as an investor living in London suddenly see myself living in Dublin instead or something? I don't know, but, but maybe there could be some uh, some 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 uh, a couple of uh, of stocks to scoop up there. Okay, so it's not something you're overly concerned about. You're not panicking about it, or you're not considering drastic moves or huge currency positions or sort of holding more in cash just before the Brexit deadline comes? You're not sort of hugely panicking about it at the moment? No, no. I, the thing is, I mentioned a couple of the risks that are, that, that are, are you know, mentioned in the central bank speech. Yep. And by other, and I don't think these are the risks that I would really, the, the, what's going to blindside the economy is something that's not listed in the official speeches. Okay. It's not going to be, we are all very aware of these things. And, you know, when uh, when Trump announced his tax cuts at the beginning of the year, that sent the markets uh, quite up a bit. Then, as you see, okay, markets are good, unemployment's down, GDP is pretty good. All right, we uh, feel we can safely uh, increase interest a little bit. All right, when that's increased a little bit and they see a negative reaction in the market, they're like, okay, fine. Instead of then raising it again three months from now, we'll we will wait a little bit and increase by a little bit less than we otherwise would have. Okay. But so they sort of manage it like that, and so so it's not going to be these well-known risk i think that i gonna it's gonna be something uh, like a black swan that, that, that'll, that'll do it if, and also these are not the sort of if we look through the last 800 years of financial crisis it's not a uh, sudden tariffs or a breakup of a you know a, a political agreement or something like that that causes the financial crisis it's usually a um yeah it could for instance be that a country's been lying about their debt so you yeah. suddenly find out Oh, actually, the numbers are a lot worse than than we thought they were. That that's a lot more uh, common problem, and that's one that you don't notice because, of course, if you knew that someone was lying about the numbers, then you would uh, you would already yeah have a have the market reaction. I think I think a lot of people who obviously are investing on eToro, where you know a lot of people come for the copy trading. I know I did because we actually don't know about markets. We may have seen some stuff on the news, some financial information, but really, it's people who. I mean, they, they watch the news, they see maybe BBC, they may see maybe uh, American news, and you hear Brexit, and it's just shrouded by such an amount of panic and such an amount of fear. But I think everyone's sort of <laughs> looking to traders like yourself, saying, oh my God, you're, you're going into a huge storm, uh, and you've got my money, and they're just there's a lot of fear. So you'd sort of, at the moment, just reassure them that uh, maybe you know things are accounted for, which they're seeing in the news as panic. Day by day, they see all this news about, you know, Theresa May and what's happening and everything's falling to bits and they hear hard Brexit and they really don't know what's going on. So, so you'd, you'd reassure them a little at this point. I think you should always size up um, the sort of media size of the story and then the 
real size of the story. And often that can lead to great um, um, points where I place trades. So you might have, you know, a company getting a fine in the millions, or hundreds of millions. And it's a big media story. It takes up a, a huge amount of space in the media mm. and the stock gets battered by 10%. Mm. And then you just consider this is a hundred billion dollar company. Yeah. You know, there's a thousand millions to a billion. Yes. So, it, it's, yes. um, so it really the impact is maximum 1%. And even with, then you account for, you know, how bad a story is this for the brand. And, and you add it out all and you see, this is, this is, this is nowhere near uh, at a 10 percent uh, punishment for this business and that might just be what tips it over into the all right i was already considering buying now that it's uh it's 10 percent lower on account of this is it, it, it's the time so um and that, that could be the same for, for um, some economic events um like this where you say actually the media uh, sizing is is, is is sort of off 